uh, welcome to the HPL seminar this week. Today, I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Rochi Deng. In 2012, Rochi started his undergraduate in mechanical engineering at the University of Kentucky, where he worked on a research project of how to improve and redesign muffler tests. After he achieved Bachelor of Science degree in 2016, he started a master's course in mechanical engineering and mechanics at the Lehigh University under the supervision of Dr. Carlos Romero and Dr. Alparslan Ostakin. During his master's, Rochi primarily um, worked on how to activate anthracite coal for elemental mercury absorption in simulated fuel blue gas. And then he achieved a master of science degree in 2019. Then he came to the University of Calgary to do a PhD in mechanical and manufacturing engineering under the super supervision of Dr. Leping Lee. Roki is currently working on statistical shape modeling methods of the knee joint for his thesis. And if I remember correctly, he's on stage of preparing a research proposal now. So in today's presentation, he wanted to give an overview of what has been done previously in this research field and talk about what he's planning to do for his thesis project. Aside from academic background, when he is not busy, he enjoys playing basketball, playing the guitar, and learning French. Today, Rochi will be giving a talk um, entitled as a statistical shape model of the knee joint, research, development, and future work. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you very much, Simon, for your introduction. Uh, and also, please uh, stop me if I have any voice issues or connection issues. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so my name is uh, Rochi Deng, and I'm a PhD student now in Dr. Leping Lee's group. Before I present my research for today's seminar, um, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Siwon Han, who is the moderator of this HPL seminar, and the Department of Kinesiology, who provide the opportunity for me to talk about my research plan. The title of my presentation today is Statistical Shape Modeling of the Knee, Plan of a Pearl Mechanical Model of the Knee Joint. I'm currently on the research proposal stage of my PhD study as C1 said. So in today's talk, I will present the previous knee joint modeling study from Dr. Liping Lee's research group, and then explain my plan following this group research. And I'm hoping to get some feedback today to, uh, for my PhD thesis. Here is the agenda of today's presentation, which include background and motivation, introduction and related concepts of statistical shape modeling, limitation and major challenges of SSM, uh, research application in statistical shape modeling of knee joint, and the future work I need for the next step. As the starter, I would like to talk about the research background. The single phase elastic material model has been broadly applied in articular cartilage mechanics studies. Such materials representing by spring elements, isotropic solid, transversely isotropic solid or fiber reinforced materials. Dr. Li and his student Gu in 2011 considered fluid pressurization in the full knee model to improve the results accuracy as the articular cartilage and menisci have shown substantial poro mechanical behavior. Single uh, phase elastic materials provide instantaneous response when applied for knee joint contact mechanics studies. However, in knee joint mechanics, load response over a short time period is often also necessary to be considered as it is normal for people to stand straight for a few minutes. This means that the creep and relaxation behavior of the knee must be considered. By studying creep and relaxation, we will learn how much loading will be distributed to the tissue matrix and 
to the flu uh, or and to the fluid pressure. In this slide, I will show the overview of the recent study of uh, from our research group about knee joint poor mechanical model. Two fiber reinforced poor mechanical finite element models of the right knee joint, one female and one male, were developed to simulate the creep behavior of human knees. Participants were initially asked to stand on their left foot on the box, placed on the top of the instrumented treadmill without applying force to their right leg. When instructed, the participants then lowered their extended right leg to contact the treadmill surface. The, uh, they were instructed to slowly increase the force applied to the right leg so that they were predominantly weight bearing on the right leg. They were told to do it as slow and smooth as possible because there was no extra, uh, ex external control on the loading speed and magnitude on the right leg. And the weight bearing posture was last for 10 minutes. After the loading test, participants were then assisted onto the MRI scanner bed and lay in a prone position. A high resolution MRI sequence was used to image the right knee. The MRI scans were used for knee joint 3D geometry reconstruction of the computational model. Following MRI scans, participants were then transferred to have their dual fluoroscopic or DF measurements. The DF measurements were used for validation of the computational model by MRI and finite element method. The reason of doing DF measurements was to evaluate the in vivo creep behavior of human knee joints during a prolonged standing and to validate the finite element model of the knee joints. I will talk about the DF image system and the computational knee model in the next few slides. The creep reaction forces measured in vivo from a force plate were used as an input in these models. The vertical reaction forces were measured by the force plate instrumented in the treadmill and used as the input for the finite element simulation. The vertical displacements of the proximal femur predicted by the models were then compared with that obtained from the DF measurement. After the validation, the mechanics of the knee joint was theoretically examined under the standard creep load up to an equilibrium state. The articular cartilage, the cartilages and menisci of the knee joint were modeled as the poor mechanical to consider creep behavior induced by fluid pressurization. And here's the contour. All the DF data is processed by Dr. Sabri Uzuner in Turkey, who was in University of Calgary as a visit scholar and doing research work with Dr. Living Lee at the time. He also constructed MRI-based finite element models and obtained all the results of this per mechanical model study. As for the dual fluoroscopic data process, process, the DF lab support was provided by Dr. Jeanette Ronsky, who also helped in the study design. The dual fluoroscopic imaging system include two high-speed video cameras, two Im image intensifiers, and two X-ray sources. High spatial and temporal resolution can be acquired with using low dose X-rays which provide accurate measurements. In Sabri's study, a six degree of freedom bone kinematics was reconstructed from DF images using a 2D to 3D registration approach. The 2D, 3D registration is the process that matches 3D bone model acquired from MRI or CT scans with the 2D X-ray image pairs. The 3D bones and cartilages models were segmented manually and refined to eliminate surface inaccuracies caused by MRI reconstruction. 
to increase the accuracy of the matching process, a newly developed MATLAB program by Dr. Serdar Kuchuk was applied to minimize the error caused by human in the 2D, 3D matching process. The sixth degree of freedom kinematics of the femur and tibia was obtained from the X-ray images using 2D, 3D manual registration. As for the computational knee model, the finite element meshes of the knee joint were generated using the reconstructed geometries from MRI scans. This subject-specific model contained the bony structures, which include femur, tibia, and fibula, and the soft tissues, which include fibro, uh, femoral and tibial cartilages, menisci, and four main ligaments. The bones were considered as rigid bodies because they are much stiffer than the soft tissues. Articular cartilages and meniscus were defined as nonlinear fiber reinforcement materials and modeled as fluid saturated porous elements because of the creep load and time dependent behavior of the knee joints. Sabri modeled the ligaments as solid elastic elements in considering of the collagen fiber effect. The reason why it is modeled as solid is because the fluid pressurization under tensile force is negligible. And the collagen network was modeled as quasi-linear viscoelastic and orthotropic fibr fibrillar matrix. The material properties of soft tissues for the knee models were obtained from the literature. The data is calibrated to match the bone kinematics from the DF measurement, which involves tuning input parameters by comparing the computational results with the experimental results. When applying loading and boundary conditions, the creep loading uses the FE computational model was from the DF test, which consists a ramp load of 12 seconds follow a standard creep loading protocol. The constant loading of 390 Newton apply on the femur in the proximal distal direction. The 390 Newton was the max value measured from the DF test of the female participant. The max force measured in the male subject was 520 Newton and 390 Newton was used for both volunteers to be more convenient in comparison. For boundary conditions, the tibia and fibula were fully constrained in all directions. No relative, uh, no relative motion between contact surfaces such as femoral cartilage to the femur, tibial cartilage to the tibia, meniscal horn to the tibial plateau, and the ligaments to the adjacent bones. Here is the comparison of DF measurement with finite element simulation of both volunteers. The vertical reaction forces were measured by the force plate instrumented in the treadmill and used as the input for finite element simulation. The vertical displacement of the femur during the DF test was calculated with respect to the tibia because only the relative displacement affects the knee joint com uh, compression. The black data line is the input for FE simulation from DF test, which is why it does not have the comparison data. The green and blue dot lines are the displacement from DF and final element modeling. From the graph, we can see the predicted vertical displacement is showing in good consistency with the DF measurement values. Previous pro-mechanical model studies focused on, their, uh, on fewer individuals. In the previous case that I just talked, it's, it only has one female and one male. Large variance occurred between uh, can occur between patient-specific models. Factors such as age, gender, or race may have significant influence when considering group of the knee population. Yon Gun and his colleagues con conclude that gender difference and variability exist in distal femoral rotational anatomy. And this research indicates that it will be better to obtain an average knee joint model of a certain group, for example, different regions such as 
North America, Asia, or Africa, etc. When considering a bigger group, the statistical shape modeling method will become useful as its advantage in describing statistical variation of different means. To explain the a statistical shape modeling method in a brief explanation, um, SSM uses a set of points to describe the outline of an object. Each point refers to the same location in every image. The coordinates of these points were subjected to Procross transformation to scale, rotate, and translate them. So removing influences of overall size. And in this slide, I'm showing the diagram summarizing the a statistical shape analysis framework. Starting from segmentation of the uh, medical imaging data, MRI or CT, the anatomical segment of interest, for example, the left knee is reconstructed to 3D shape models. And these two steps are repeated for all the patients in the population. The mean shape will then be generated. The principal component analysis was then applied to the coordinates of the set of points for all the images. This is a data reduction approach that produces a small set of orthogonal modes or principal components for, uh, from the large number of co coordinates. Each mode describes the variations in shape that occur in a coordinate fashion. The PCA or principal component analysis allows researchers to compare variations in shape. For example, plus or minus two standard deviation from the mean shape and perform quantitative assessments. The SSM on knee joint, including tibia and femur have been applied in clinical field in the past decades. And I'm showing some of the recent research applications in this slide. Lynch's group and Gregory's group conclude the ability of SSM to observe and describe the disease progression in knees over a long time period. Severus group state that the SSM can be used to predict potential misalignment in the knee for a new patient by processing the bone shapes. Although SSM has such charming aspects in geometry modeling, uh, limitations are still existing. The first one is that the power of SSM based shape prediction rely on the variations contained in the given training data set. This means that the results may be influenced in the case where input data may be deteriorated. The abnormal local shape variation exists due to pathology, which are not modeled by the shape distribution. The shape outside of the variation in the training database cannot be described by the distribution. And it also requires a large population of representative training samples. The modeling fits requires initial guess, which may lead to misalignment of the model. And I'll explain this in the next slide. When having two or more discrete shapes, one of the fundamental problem in the shape analysis is to find a meaningful relation between somatic entities and thus the entire parameterization. As the face figure showing on this slide, when the tip of the nose on the left side is wrongly set into the correspondence with the point on the cheek, which on the right side. The average of the two heads will reveal an uh, implausible correspondence. I'm having the head models for better visualization. Uh, when processing the knee joint modeling, mistakes in making correspondence of the landmarks will cause significant variance between the produced and or original knee model. Such uh, correspondence can be hard to estimate as it not only requires an understanding of the structure at local and global scales, but also need to take somatic information about anatomical entities or functionality into account. 
Dr. Ahmed Ed Erdmia of Clinic, uh, Cleveland Clinic in US is one of the researchers in the study of finite element knee joint model. And he published a uh, public finite element knee model called Open Knee Project. Um, according to the discussion with him previously, the first challenge is to get enough knee geometries that are segmented, geometry reconstructed at this level. The other challenges include potentially large parameter set because shape models of bones may need to be coupled with separate shape models of ligament volumes, including insertion origin and the menisci, et cetera. Dr. Brent Edwards and his uh, PhD student, Olivia Bruce, are in the study of building statistical shape model of tibia, tibial fibula complex. And I have discussed with them about SSM procedure of full knee joint model. Based on their experience, they found, that, uh, found out that the, the image segmentation and registration are the hard parts of the modeling process. And the reason may due to the large number of images that needs to be segmented manually and the understanding in anatomical features of the knee joints. And I will spend time to look for solutions to deal with these challenges and difficulties. And hopefully it can be addressed in my modeling approach in the future. The goal of my research is to build an average knee joint model, uh, which can be used in many fields such as clinical applications to save more time and costs. Ideally, it can represent most of the shape features of the bone and it may only need to change a few characterized parameters when modeling a new knee joint, out, uh, which is out of the, uh, of the modeling group. To accomplish this goal, the research plan, including literature review in SSM of knee joint and the implementation of the research resources that public online to build a statistical shape knee joint model. The public resources include st statistical shape model from Rao and his following colleagues from University of Denver, automated landmark detector method by Xue and his colleague at German published in 2014. And uh, we will also use 118 knee joint MRI from osteoarthritis initiative database. Also, and additionally, the files, documents shared by Ms. Olivia Bruce and Dr. Brent Words, Edwards research group will help me a lot in my future modeling work. In roughly estimation, such modeling work to, could take up to a few months. Um, although the challenges of using SSM in full knee remains to be addressed, uh, there are still some approaches in the past few years. And I'm showing the one of the closest research available online, which is Rao and the collaborators uh, development. They have developed a statistical shape knee model to characterize the variability of the knee joint. In 2014, Xuan and his colleague proposed a somatic registration method for tibia, femur, and patella model to localize each knee bone in the data set ob obtained. And I will ex expand their research in the next few slides. Rao and his colleague have created the SSM model for the structure of the knee, including the tibia, femur, patella, associated articular cartilage, and soft tissue structures. The initial publication used 20 cadaver specimens in 2013, and the training set expanded to 50 subjects, showing in their 2015 article. Based on their description in the article, the knee structure was segmented from MRI images and then and an iterative closest point algorithm, ICP, connected the nodes on a fine mesh for each training set member to a template mesh. Structures were described in their local coordinate system 
and the relative alignment between the structures in the S scan position described by four times four transformation. The statistical model utilizes the nodal coordinates for the knee structures and the transformation matrix in the principal component analysis to capture the shape and alignment variability. By applying PCA, the data representing the variability in the training set is essentially reduced from, the, from about 27,000 individual variables to a series of nominally a dozen orthogonal variables. The finite element analysis were performed on models generated from the statistical shape and alignment model. Joint mechanics were evaluated for the average and the first two modes at plus minus one standard deviation with contact pressure and area showing at 30 degree tibial femoral flexion. Tibial femoral contact pressures were higher and patella contact area notably smaller in the smaller geometry of mode one. An important finding of the, uh, of the authors is the ability of the model to maintain the congruency between articular patches resulting in realistic contact patches without significant edge loading or sharp unnatural articular surfaces. As I mentioned before, the challenge exists in the image segmentation and registration processes. One of the hard parts is the difficulties in estimating the correspondence between the image and entire parametrization. Locating landmarks on knee joint structures manually is usually challenging and time consuming. And Shred and his colleagues proposed an automated method to detect landmarks. They define the landmarks on the surface of knee bones, including bone cartilage interface the landmarks are also defined on the most lateral, medial, superior, posterior points and notches of the bones. And this slide shows the 24 landmarks of the knee joint structure that they define, including tibia, femur, and patella. Here is the flowchart of the proposed automated landmark detection method from Xue's publication. Predefined landmarks were manually selected by experienced technicians for landmark detection training purposes. In the step of automated landmark detection, interest points with high gradient magnitude of pixel intensity were searched for in target datasets using a simplified difference of Gaussian detector. Next, uh, both training landmarks and interest points and target datasets were characterized using a scale invariant feature transform descriptor or so-called SIFT descriptor. The SIFT descriptor was generated by computing the gradient magnitude and orientation at each image sample point in its surrounding region. Interest points with minimal SIFT distance to training landmarks were chosen as candidates for landmarks. And finally, to achieve high localization accuracy and robustness, they have, uh, they have applied a multi-classifier booting system to combine results derived from the different training data sets. And this proposed method may be an efficient tool for me to, uh, to automatically detect knee joint landmarks in MRI data sets. The collaboration with this research group in future may be really helpful for my modeling work. And here are the descriptive st statics table for uh, of 118 knee joint MRI scan subject details. The data can be accessed at Osteoarthritis Initiative Database or OAI database. The data include MRI slice thickness, field of view, MRI coordinate system, etc. And this group of 118 MRI scans will be really helpful in my 
a modeling work also in the next step as it will save my time in the measurement step. Um, my next step, like I said before, will be the practice of knee joint geometry reconstruction based on the 118 MRI scan. And I will, and the, uh, and I will follow or at least learn the documents and MATLAB code shared by Ms. Olivia Bruce. And the result analysis will be the step after them. And finally, I would like to acknowledge the support from the National Science and Engineering Research Council of, China, of Canada, Dr. Janet Ronsky for participating in the study design and DF support for the pro-mechanical study. And Dr. Liping Lee and Dr. Sabri Uzna for the advice and instruction in my research. Dr. Brent Edwards and his PhD student, Olivia Bruce also gave me a big help by suggestions and share the documents related with SSM to get me on track as soon as possible. And Dr. Ahmed Erdmir provides his resources in the knee joint modeling field. And I would really like to thank you all for listening to my talk and I'm eager for questions, comments, or suggestions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hirochi, for um, giving an interesting talk and nice overview of your work. So now if you could unshare your screen so we could see each other, yeah, it'd be great. Thank you very much. I would also like to kindly encourage everyone to turn on your camera if you feel comfortable with it. Um, I think it'll allow us for um, having more active discussion period. Thanks for doing that. So if you have any questions for our speaker, Rochi, please use the icon raise and button, which um, can be found if you go click reaction icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If your Zoom doesn't um, have any, doesn't show the button there, please also feel free to send me um, the message via Zoom chat, and I'll call on you or read your question for you when it's your turn. Now I'll open the floor for the questions. Actually, let me um, start asking you a question because um, I was kind of interested in um, how you introduced the Rao et al. study in 2013. Um, okay. But I'm also just curious how relevant their results are to, to human in vivo knee joint because they use 20 specimens, right. um, cadaveric specimens. So, I also do not know the age of the knee joints that they tested. So I'm just curious, um, would um, there be similar to in vivo um, data? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the first question, uh, yes. Uh, the, reason why, the reason why I cho chose, the, uh, chose the Rouse research about the 20 specimens group is because uh, they are the uh, closest uh, closest research so far to apply SSM on the full knee joint. Uh, there are also some approaches on the on the tibia fibula geometry approach, but uh, uh, but almost no one have used uh, SSM on the full knee joint before. So uh, I found their research really interesting, and uh, I think uh, the methods. That, uh, the method they apply can be really helpful in my research work. Yeah. And they, they actually have a uh, project a website which they expand their uh, specimen into 50, 50 specimens. So uh, with 25 female, 25 males and about uh, talking about the age, uh, yes, I believe different I believe the age will is the factor of uh, of uh, differentiating the uh, knee geometries, but I would need to figure that out by either literature readings or yeah or the scanning. Yeah. Thank you. I see Art. You have a question for Rochi. Uh, yeah, my question is basically why twelve, and uh, what I'm referring to is your uh, principal components analysis. 
And um, just as kind of a, a joke, 80% um, of biomechanics articles that use PCA report that three principal components explain 80% of their data. And um, so the question is why, why do you need so many? And uh, when you have 12 components and then uh, what's, how do you express the criterion for the basically explained variance? Like uh, what is that quantity? And then also what's the drop off like um, when you're getting to the 10th or 12th component? Uh, oh, unfortunately for, yeah, I can't answer the questions about why it's 12 at this time, but yeah, because yeah, so far my, uh, in my understanding, the, uh, the, the function, functionality for PCA is to reduce the huge uh, the dimensions or the uh, dimension of the data sets. So I haven't think about why, I haven't thought about why it's only 12, they only need, needs to be reduced to 12 components. But uh, yeah, I will, I would, that, that, that's a really good question. I would definitely work on that too. Well, I, I don't think uh, any of us can probably answer really why, but it's more like, what's the drop off like? So you, you must have an explained variance uh, versus mm -hmm. number of components. And then that graph will start, uh, you know, it'll, it'll uh, basically, as you add components, you'll start from zero explained variance and you'll head towards 100%. Right. And I'm just wondering, what does that graph look like? And then also, what's the definition of explained variance? Like, um, is this in terms of, uh, you know, a, uh, so an example, if you're looking at surfaces, you would just look, say, at the mean square error between, uh, across your surface of say the Z direction deviations or, or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand your qu questions right. Uh, do you want me to, uh, are you asking about the, like the standard deviation? Uh, well, the, okay, um, I, I think I'm confusing things. I, I have two questions. One question is uh, you must have chosen 12 as being reasonable because you looked at a graph of explained variance versus number of components. And then you said, oh, when we get to 12, that's when I'm satisfied. And so I'm just wondering how, you know, that, that graph is an increasing graph and it does the slope levels off as you go higher. And I'm just wondering what that graph looks like. And then the second question is, what exactly was the criterion for explained variance? So, you know, you're defining a, um, a, a quantity, which you're trying to um, explain. And so was that say the mean square Z surface error or was it something else? Uh, yeah, I'll, for that one, I can't, I can't answer clearly right now. In my guess, it's, it will be, uh, it will be related to the knee joint surfaces. And since uh, they will use that as a, uh, parameter, I guess, but yeah, I don't have the clear answer for now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Would there be any more question for Rochi? Um, actually, I also have a more question, Rochi, for you. Um, so, um, so, you, so you say you're gonna make a model but do you have a specific um, thoughts that to how your model could be applied for the clinical research field? Um, be... About, about uh, how? Um, yeah. Yeah, that will also be a really good question for me because so far I'm focusing on how should I apply the current existing methods to model the, model the, model the needs by using SSM. And yeah, uh, the think about the application will be the be the step after I success successfully build up the model. Yeah, but thank you very much for the suggestion for the question. Thanks. I see Chantal. You have a question for Rochi. Um. Yeah. Thanks. 
Um, yeah, thanks. That was a really interesting talk. Um, and it sounds like it'll be a really cool study. Um, I just had a question about your image registration um, methods. So I might have missed this, but since you're looking at kind of like multiple bones and structures in the knee, how do you plan to account for soft tissue movement and like differences in positioning? Um, right, because like if you have a knee that's positioned like at an angle versus perfectly straight, um, how do you account for that when you're looking at multiple bones at once? Yeah, that's uh, that's also a really interesting question because so that uh, so far, so far uh, the lit based on the literatures and I, I, the researchers are focusing on having the landmarks on uh, having the landmarks on the uh, bones. So for the cartilages or ligaments, I may need to have more research on how are they gonna do it? How are they gonna like uh, take the landmarks? Maybe maybe it requires, uh, uh, it, can be, it can be done by the personal preferences or uh, they may have uh, like the standards to uh, about like uh, where we should choose or something like that. I will look for, I will look, uh, spend more time in looking for the uh, methods about uh, how are they gonna place the landmarks or how are they gonna choose the points from the uh, ligaments or cartilages or meniscus. Yeah. I hope, yeah, I hope this yeah. can, uh, this, uh, my, I hope this can help, help a little bit in answering your question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That'll be really interesting. I'm, I'm really curious how you'll kind of yeah. solve, solve that. It's, it's something that, I don't know, I think is tricky when looking at whole joints. Right, of course. Yeah, yeah I've noticed that because it, it's kind of tricky. So, yeah, but I will figure it out. I'll try to figure it out. I see, Walter, you have a question for Rochi. Yeah, thanks, I have a, a couple of more technical questions and the, the first one is that, you know, you mentioned that when you do the, or when people did the fluoroscopy creep measurements that, you know, the fluoroscopy has very good uh, spatial and temporal resolution and not being so familiar with that. Uh, can, can you tell me what the spatial and temporal resolution of that uh, dual fluoroscopy system actually is? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't have, that much knowledge about the uh, DF, DF measurements, uh, uh, such uh, such informations I obtained are from the uh, from Dr. Lee's and Dr. Sabri's research. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, what I'm focusing on is more about the uh, statistical shape modeling field. So. Mm -hmm. For the DF, for the DF imaging, um, the uh, what I what what I basically know is the how they how they generally work and how uh, how they was used in savory studies. Yeah. Uh, what I may answer this question? Sure. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> he did, he didn't spend time on that. Uh, it's uh, somebody else work. Uh, the the time resolution is really, really good. So we we are able to manage to get about 580 uh, images uh, during 10 minutes. So it, we are still actually using the slowest, lowest frequency to take pictures. Otherwise, mm -hmm. that would be too much uh, X-ray uh, exposure. So we, we have like a 580, so that's not bad. But the spatial is a big question, of course. Uh, sp spatial, I guess, is not very good. But from a uh, 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 genus group, uh, the conclusion is something like, uh, I don't remember exactly. It's like 0 0.3. Uh, the results at the end could have uh, a resolution like a 0 0.3 millimeters. So, so it's still not that good. There are a lot of uh, human factors there. So yeah, that's yeah. how much I know. Be because yeah. that would have been my guess that, that you get maybe, a, um, I, I thought maybe you get about a tenth of a millimeter and you say 0.3 because 
your creep phase there after 50 seconds for the remaining 550 seconds for the example that was yeah. shown is about 0.3 millimeters. Yeah. And, and you know, that's if, that's the, if that's the resolution of the system and it doesn't change more than that over about, you know, over most of your experiment over 550 out of the 600 seconds, then I, then I wonder, you know, how, how confident, you know, you can be in that particular measurement. And it's just something some to think about, you know. Yeah, uh, that 0 0.3 may, may not be the correct number. I think it's probably smaller than that, but not much smaller. It's not like a, uh, yeah. 0 0.03. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. no, I was, I was just thinking that, you know, yeah. the, the, the graph that's shown there is about yeah. half a micron, half a micron per second increase, yeah. you know, if you uh, assume a straight line. And yeah. I was just wondering, you know, half a micron, how many half microns do you need <laughs> yeah. before you see a change? Yeah, yeah. And I expect that maybe 200 half microns, which gives you 0.1 millimeters. So that would be about, you know, 200, every 200 seconds, you would see a change. So, I mean, yeah, the, other, the other thing that I had is uh, um, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand how the creep was measured. Is that measured? Did I understand it correctly that it's measured as a, as a displacement of the femur? Uh, towards the ground, is that correct or? Yeah, that's the, oh no, it's the relative displacement between the two bones. Okay, so you have a, a marker on the tibia somehow and one on the- uh, There's no the, mark, there's yeah. no mark. Uh, so the, we have like a 580 images from uh, okay. both cameras. So that's uh, from the process of the cameras. So it's a, the relative uh, displacement. Uh, like you fix uh, the uh, tibia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the rest Thank of the question should go to uh, Rochi. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't Thank know. <laughs> I don't know which ones go to Roach and which ones do not. No, it's, um, it's really similar. It's not right. Okay. okay. The, <laughs> okay thank you. The, the other, the other question that much. I had, yeah, the other question that I had was, um, you know, when you talked about these uh, 3D shape models that you're getting of the 118 bones, um, are those shapes just of the bone or just of the surface or do you get the bone and the cartilage with the surface and the bone and the cartilage are separated somehow? Uh, it will be uh, more deep uh, for the 118 MRI scans, the, uh, the uh, geom, it should be, it should be more related with the uh, bone surfaces with the cartilages. But mm -hmm. yeah, I would- Can, Like for, I guess the question that I'm trying to get at, do you, do you get a cartilage sickness from that or you just kind of get the outer shape of it? Out of the shape, I believe. Okay, and so you don't know, uh, like you might have a similar shape in two bones, but the cartilage sickness might be quite different. And you wouldn't see that, is that correct or? Uh, I'm not very sure, but yeah, okay. that, that makes sense. Yeah, they should be okay. somewhere like this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the last question, really more a conceptual question is, you know, you said you're building on Brent's and Olivia's work and you're building uh, on work from Amit, uh, er Erdemir and, and some other people. Um, for, your, for your thesis, is there a novel component there, like something where you, don't extend people's work where, but where you actually, uh, you know, produce something that's quite unique and doesn't exist yet. Right. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I would need, uh, my, my point in, in do maybe, maybe, uh, like, for example, addressing, uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of the limitations or one of the challenges existing right now in the SSM in, in SSM modeling, and yeah, uh, that's what that's uh, what it what's in my thoughts so far in my PhD okay. thesis. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the modeling work based on the existing research will be my first step. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Would there be any other question for Ro Rochi?
since I um, do not see anyone raise your hand, um, so let me just ask the last question to Rochi then. So Rochi, once you um, build your model, what do you want to do with that model? Uh, well, <laughs> that's also another really good question, interesting question. Uh, this model, uh, since I said before, this model can be applied in uh, can be applied in clinical field. For for example, in the uh, in cartilage uh, implants or like the uh, for example TPA or something like that, and or for some other for or for some other research such as the uh, uh, osteoarthritis progression uh, in study of that uh, the other. Uh, yeah that's and there may be there may be some other fields that can be really helpful but i believe the uh statistical shape model will uh, which re, uh, represents a population of the uh, of the patients will definitely be really useful yeah. Yeah. i see thank you yep i see walter you have a, also a question about this yeah, you know, since nobody else asks anymore, and so I, I thought, you know, this is obviously a research proposal, and it's understandable that 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 there's still a lot of thinking to be done, and and so you know, one of the things that maybe people could contribute a little bit in the next ten minutes is uh, to potentially make suggestions on what might be done with the model, or also potentially uh, like how they see how how a model like that could be used or improved. And you know, one of the things that, that, that Rochi said that I thought was really, 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 really interesting and, uh, and also very difficult is the whole thing about you know, osteoarthritis biomarkers. You know, and we have biomarkers, obviously people looking in the blood and so, but people have been looking for you know, imaging uh, biomarkers. And uh, you know, if a model like that could be constructed that could be shown to be accurate enough. And for example, you know, give the creep type of properties that you measured or, um, or look at, you know, just joint space narrowing, or you were also mentioning one study where they claimed that uh, within 12 months, they would see changes in the shape of the surfaces that might potentially be indicative, you know, might be kind of like biomarkers for an ongoing OA. Uh, you know, I, I think that's actually really exciting. And if you could come up with just one little thing out of your model that at the end of the day, you can say, hey, I think I can, I can uh, you know, monitor, I can detect over 12 months, which sounds like a long time, but in human OA is very little. I can detect over 12 months, very distinct changes if somebody has a progressive OA I, I think that would be really neat. And, and maybe you and Lei Ping and maybe other people, you know, could think about what might potentially be the most powerful way of doing that. You know, is it a creep test? Is it a joint space narrowing? And if so, how would you do that? Is it a change in the shape of the femur or, 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 the, or, the, or the patella? That type of thing. So I think there's a lot of things here. And maybe, and maybe some other people uh, can chirp in and, and voice a little bit what they see uh, that uh, what Rochi might be able to do. Yeah, that sounds really, really, really good. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Rizzo. Yes, Olivia, um, please go ahead. Sure, so I'll just follow off of kind of what Walter was saying. And uh, I guess my first question is for the 118 scans that you have, were any of those, are all of them healthy? Do some of them have a way? Yes, they're healthy. Healthy, healthy okay. Yeah. Okay, so that that gives a good baseline um, that you could use to compare to OA. Uh, not being super familiar with OA and, and all of the factors that affect it, are there sex differences? Uh, yeah, for that I would need I would need more time to take into it, but it should be there should be sex differences based on the, uh, a previous paper. Mm -hmm. In a published in 2018, they they mentioned that the uh, they mentioned that the uh, gender differences are uh, on uh, with the let me see uh, let me see who 
right. So if sex that, differences were, yeah, say, a risk uh, factor for OA, you could kind of use the model to, yeah, you could use the model to look at, um, to quantify sex differences within the group that you have. Yeah. Um, you know, you could also, if you're doing finite element analysis, maybe perturb. Uh, so there's there's papers that have shown, you know, moving uh, the alignment of the tibia and femur by one millimeter uh, affects contact force by about 50 newtons. Um, and similarly, like an alignment change of one degree would produce a similar change um, in contact force. So maybe you start perturbing your um, your shape and see how that affects contact forces at the knee. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, and so that, and of course, if you're using standard or generic material properties, then you're getting at just those specific shape changes. Um, and of course, you can also change material properties, but that you don't have, can you determine material properties from the MRI scans that you have? Uh... I do not think so, but yeah, the, the data I can get, it, it will be probably the uh, geometries. Yeah, and I, I, I may need to, I may need to apply the uh, material properties after then, after the uh, geom uh, geometry reconstruction. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Sarah, you have a question for Rochi? Yeah, I question or just some other thoughts, I think, along the lines with where what Walter was suggesting. Um, what, what was a little bit unclear to me, and so maybe this is the question part, um, and I think Chantal and Walter were both trying to get at this too, is whether the model will account for bone shape independently from cartilage shape. Um, and, and I think that's something that would probably be a pretty novel contribution, because there has been a a, a right. lot, a lot of that, that. That that is the that is the hard part for uh, in, uh, in my research because uh, my goal will be try to present the uh, uh, whole model, including the bones and cartilages and maybe uh, ligaments. But so far, right now, I'm focusing on the bones and cartilages men meniscus. Yeah. I like. I think that would be a really novel contribution. Like, yeah. And, and then specifically looking at the interaction between bone shape and cartilage, mm -hmm. there have been with the OAI. I believe they they've shown sex differences in bone shape and some yeah. sex, or sorry progression of bone shape right. over time as well. Right. Um. But most of the OAI has focused on cartilage, and and that's the one part that yeah. I could have missing. And I guess the other. Oh, there are two other comments. One is in terms of material properties, uh, this is linking to Olivia's question. I believe they have T2 maps in the, all of the OAI data as well, and which okay. get at some cartilage properties. So that's something else you could think about okay. over, potentially in your model. Sure. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll say is we're getting a new weight bearing CT scanner. Um, it was supposed to be delivered in three weeks, but it's just been delayed again. And so this actually relates to a fair bit of work that I'm interested in doing. So I'd be keen to talk to you in Lei Ping um, going forward, because I think in that weight bearing CT scanner, you have somebody standing and we can look at how the tissues really interact um, in that true weight bearing position, which you can't get in a normal MRI. We obviously can't look at cartilage, but we can look at joint space. Um, we can look at bone very clearly. So you know, it's, it's something to, talk about in the future. Okay, yeah, sounds really good. Yeah, thank you very much. I see, yeah, Walter, you have a question or comments for Rochi? Yeah, just to, um, you know, when, when you were talking to uh, uh, Olivia, that's when I became aware of that, uh, all the data that you're using is from normal. And of course, you know, one of the arguments that you can make is that you provide this beautiful uh, data set of normal and then the challenge would be uh, you know, for somebody else uh, to create a similar data set for, you know, mild and moderate and severe OA. And that might be really neat if you then statistically speaking, this is statistical shape modeling, if you could show that there are very distinct patterns that might evolve in terms of the surface shapes, let's say, of the, of the knee joint as OA progresses. 
you know, I mean, we, we think that joint space narrows and, and, and some other things, but maybe there is also something just really in the, in the shape of the surface areas of the bones. And I think that could be really a neat little challenge for other people once you have your right. you know, control data, your healthy control data. Right. Yeah. And actually in SSM, there is a, uh, there are a, uh, a one certain type, certain type of SSM that can uh, not only model the, uh, not only model the external geometry, but also consider the uh, internal structure and appearance. So I believe uh, with with that, with the, it's, it's called statistical uh, shape, a, st a statistical appearance model. Uh, yeah, so I believe with that applications, it may be a, a big step for me in that contribution. Yeah, in that, yeah, in that field contribution. Yeah, thanks. Will there be any last comments or question for our speaker? If not, I would like to thank Rochi again for sharing his work with us. So next week, uh, we have an, an invited speaker, Dr. Greg Sawicki from Georgia Institute of Technology. And he will talk about looking under the skin to understand the human exoskeletal interaction during locomotion. I would like to thank Dr. Eric Honert for inviting him. I hope you enjoy the long weekend and I'll see you next week. <laughs>